Welcome indeed to our virtual worship. My name is Katie Gilbert and I serve as our executive pastor and use the pronouns she and her. I have a couple of announcements that I wanna share with you today. The first is that we are growing, especially in our children and youth ministries. 
And as such, we are in need of more volunteers, both on Sunday mornings and now on Wednesday evenings. This coming Sunday, February 26, we will offer a training for anyone interested in serving in these ministry areas. It'll be immediately following worship. A light lunch will be served along with safe sanctuary materials covered. And once you've completed that training, you'll be ready to jump in and help us in these growing areas. Friends, we want to continue to raise up the youngest among us and we need your help. So we hope you'll consider this opportunity to jump right in and help us as we grow our future together. Our second announcement is a reminder about our Fat Tuesday celebration happening this Tuesday, February 21st at 6 o'clock p.m. in our large dining room. Even if you didn't yet make a, have the opportunity to make a reservation, we have hoped you will come and have added in a buffer, so there is room for you to come and join us. We'll be celebrating with beignets and pancakes with live jazz music and looking forward to bringing a little bit of Mardi Gras here into downtown Birmingham. In addition, we'll be raising funds for our Panama trip that will take place this summer. You'll be invited to make a donation either by cash, by check, or by credit card if you choose. Friends, we hope you will come put on your sparkles or your color and join us as we celebrate Fat Tuesday together. Then the following day will be Ash Wednesday, February 22nd. We'll hold two Ash Wednesday services, one at 12 o'clock p.m. in our chapel and a second at 6.30 p.m. here in our beautiful sanctuary. Prior to that 6.30 p.m. Uh, service, we will have our regular Wednesday night dinner. So this is your reminder to go in and sign up if you plan to join us for dinner. Of course, you don't have to come to dinner, nor do you need to make a reservation to join us in worship. You are invited simply to come as together we begin our Lenten journey. Friends, with these announcements shared, will you join me in prayer? God of love, we give great thanks for these moments set apart to focus solely on you. May we be fully present as we move into the moments ahead. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Ashley Hess. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Minister of Youth and Justice. Please join me this morning in our prayer of confession. Oh, holy God, we know we have fallen short. We turn our backs when we could embrace. We remain silent when we could speak. We speak when we could listen. We judge when we could seek understanding. We cling when we could give. Forgive us, O oh God, for focusing solely on ourselves and help us to continue to grow into the people you created us to be. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our divine creator is the one who models for us the ability to be quick to listen and slow to anger. God is always longing to reconcile when relationships are broken. Hear the good news. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. Hear these words. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life for, to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Now will you join me in prayer? Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing. Yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, whose compassion lights up the world. Transform us into the likeness of the love of Christ, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, and who taught us to pray the prayer that he taught his closest friends, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This morning, as we move into our time of offering, and as we prepare to raise funds for our Panama trip later this summer on Fat Tuesday, we want to remind you that a portion of our operating budget goes to our friends in Panama each and every year. We send funds to our partners in Senegita, Panama to help provide transportation for school children who do not have means to get back and forth reliably to school each and every day. Friends, when you make a gift to First Church, your gift truly does have a global reach. By reaching out to our friends in Panama and helping to support the work there year in and year out, we are making a difference. And so this morning, I invite you to give. You can do so through our website by clicking on the Give tab and Make a Gift. You can do so by sending a check. No matter how you choose to give, we invite you to be generous because each of us is created in the generous and loving image of God. Hi, and welcome to virtual worship. I'm Stephanie York Arnold. I'm the senior pastor here at First Church, and my pronouns are she and her. So here we are at the culmination of our Walk Gently sermon series, which is focused upon the wise admonishment of James for us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, I've already confessed that I am largely the exact opposite of those wise words by my most basic instinctual nature. 
I tend to be slow to listen, quick to speak, and at times easily angered. But before I frighten you too much, let me share that I deeply understand that fault in my initial response. And I have and I do spend time working to grow in those areas. And that is what this sermon series is all about for each of us. Today we land on discussing anger, which I think is really important for us as individuals and for us as a collective society. Let's begin by sharing some working definitions of the words anger and disgust. These emotions are ones that Brene Brown says society often considers negative emotions. But we should all take note that that is not really helpful for us because emotions are simply there to inform us about how we feel about a situation. And that is vital for our own information and for our decision making. Brown defines anger as what we feel when something gets in the way of what we want or disrupts the way we think things are supposed to be. Brown says that anger is a highly active state. It makes us want to lash out, to fix the perceived problem, and hurt whatever or whoever has caused us to be angry. Disgust is a strong aversion to something or someone. Brown believes that disgust stems from wanting to protect ourselves from a toxic substance. But that protective instinct has somehow grown to be extended to protecting ourselves from toxic people and toxic ideas. Okay, so hear that part again. Anger is what we feel when something disrupts what we want or what we think should be done. Disgust is wanting to protect ourselves from something we believe or perceive is toxic. So watch this short clip from the movie Inside Out, which depicts these very common and human emotions for all of us. Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Think it's safe? What is it? Uh, okay, uh, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yeah! Well, I just saved our lives. Ooh. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not gonna get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you wanna play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, ah! Hey, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh. Airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <gasps> so we all have these basic emotions. They are at work within us to help protect ourselves. And so these are not bad emotions. They are simply important information for our system. And we're called to shepherd them with wisdom, with love, and with grace. I say this because I think many of us have been raised to believe that getting angry is bad. Showing our temper can only be perceived as negative, especially when we're a person of faith. And I think texts like today's have often been used to perpetuate the deep repression of our feelings to ours and to other persons' great detriment. The truth is we all deal with anger in personal and very nuanced ways. Some of us are capable of expressing our anger when we feel it almost immediately. While others of us kind of stuff it down, hide it away until we reach a boiling point and it overflows. Some of us like to over talk things. Some of us hardly say anything at all. Some of us are outward processors while others of us are internal processors. Now, I don't really know why, but from an early age and stage in our family's development, we began showing one another how we each respond when angry at the dinner table. We would act out for each other how each family member acted when we made them angry. Steve's anger was the most immediate, and he would tend to have this little quiver in his voice if you made him mad enough. 
My anger almost always involved a step point and raised eyebrows, as if you were trying to permeate an impenetrable force field of my will. George's anger would come pouring out in a river of dramatic and emotional words, normally indicating the very real screw-up of a parent that you were. And Sawyer would hardly say anything to you, even if he was feverishly mad at you. But then you might hear things being beaten or slung around in his room later, all while he continued to say, I'm fine. As a family, we would laugh at this around the table. But it also allowed us to witness, while we were not angry, how the rest of the family experienced our emotions of anger and disgust. Honestly, I think it's been really helpful for us to see our reactions from an objective place and to be able to talk about how we each respond when we're angry. We have also, over dinner, taken the time at different points to name to each other those words or things that have been said to one another that have hurt when we have gotten mad. Now, this is hard to hear for sure because at that point, nobody's angry and no one wants to hurt each other. But we recognize we all have, even though we love one another. Taking the time to talk about those words and the impact they have gives each of us the chance to say what we really mean and to apologize from the depths of our love for the harm we've caused. It can't undo the hurt that our angry words caused, but hopefully it can offer a new message of love that will grow in time and be more powerful. I want to name that I don't think the problem is our anger or our disgust. I think those are good emotions. They are protective emotions, informing emotions. Instead, our problem is how we learn to address how we feel. Scripture is not telling us not to feel angry, but is instructing us on being wise in how we express that anger. If we are practicing the first part of this passage, I believe it is likely that we will have a greater capacity to live well into, lo into the latter part of the passage. If we listen first to understand if we choose the right way and the right time to speak our truth, we will likely find our anger is expressed in a more healthy way. Our Romans text is trying to give actions to our love and to further flesh out our responses even when we are angry. I love how in the message translation it says, to love from the center of who you are to bless your enemies, not curse them under your breath. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. And if you've got it in you, get along with everybody. What is clear to me when I read this is that when I'm feeling my anger immediately, I'm not able to practice many or any of those things. The intensity of my feeling is so great that I don't want to bless someone who has derailed my plan or who threatens my sense of well-being. When I feel hurt, my instinct is naturally defensive and it's aggressive. I want to hit back. I'm moving way too fast to discover beauty or truth or connection in others when I'm mad. And that is why James invites us to practically slow down. Maybe we can't slow down the feeling of anger. It seems we have very little control over that. And we need that anger to guide us. But with practice and intention, we can slow down our reaction to the feeling so that we do not lead absent of our mindful consent when we feel angry. Consider for yourself how you have handled your own anger and how you have felt after the adrenaline has waned from your body. Sometimes I feel totally justified in my anger and I feel that I responded well. But sometimes my response to those feelings has also totally undermined my rightness and I am now left needing to apologize. Has anybody else been there? Like when we get so mad and then we act out, we give up the high ground by our own response. That says to me that we need to slow down. Just because you feel the emotion then, in that moment, doesn't always mean that that's the best time to deliver your expression of that emotion 
or for that emotion to be received by the person you need to deliver it to. I remember years ago, my close friend Stephanie, who lives across the country, talked to me about anger and relationships. And she said one time she had to ask herself, would she rather just be right or be loving? Does she want to win the argument or make forward progress in the relationship? That's a powerful question to reflect upon for all of us. Sometimes we are right in our anger, but we need to slow down and wait for others to reach a point to receive our anger, to hear our pain well, to have the conversation and to move forward with grace. Sometimes we need our anger to step right into that moment, but likely we can only do that well if we have practiced moving slowly and listening so that we know when that moment comes that we can trust ourselves to speak while angry, but with still some measure of love and grace that is necessary. Friends, I have gotten this right sometimes, and I have so often gotten this wrong. I've gotten this wrong with some of you. I have gotten this wrong with all of the members of my own family. I've gotten this wrong at times with my colleagues who I love dearly. I share that to remind you that we're all human, and our humanity inevitably involves imperfection. We share the commonality of speaking quickly in our anger, of hurting one another, of acting in ways that do not always express our faith and our love. We all stand in the need of forgiveness and of continual grace. And the more we offer and receive that love and grace, between one another, I think the easier we will find it to access that grace when we're angry and we're hurt. Grace helps instruct our anger so that we use it well for correction, for growth, and reconciliation. And I want to close by offering you, much like my family does around the dinner table, a light-hearted approach from a comedy that came out many years ago called Anger Management. It beautifully illustrates our biblical mandate to slow down when we're angry. When you feel that rush of red hot anger pulsing through your veins and in your body, perhaps you will consider singing a silly song as you choose to respond more slowly and see if it helps cool those fiery flames before you burn yourself or another. Now, what exactly was that all about, Dave? What? You just ran through a red light. Are you trying to get us both killed? Well, I'm a little flustered right now. I have to be to work in eight minutes. Flustered? Whoa, man. What are you doing? I need you to unfluster. My boss is going to go nuts on me if we're late, so please. We will proceed when you are centered. I'm centered, I'm centered, I'm centered. Come on, there's 10,000 people behind us. Let's go, crazy man! What is that? Is that good? We're going to sing a song. No, I don't want to sing a song. I want to go to, I want to, I gotta go. Oh, here we go. The magic of Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim's West Side Story. I feel pretty. Let's get this thing moving! Shut your pie hole! We're working here! Wow, sorry. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum, bum. I feel pretty. Oh, so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and gay And I pity any girl who isn't me today La 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 I feel charming, oh so charming is a running out charming eye and so pretty. 
that I hardly can believe I'm real. La 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 la. See that pretty girl in the mirror there? What mirror where? Who could that attractive girl be? Who, which one where? Hum, such a pretty face, such a pretty face, such a pretty face. Yes. I feel stunning. You feel stunning. And entrancing. And entrancing. Feel like running and dancing, dancing for joy. For I love. Thanks be to God for instructive and correcting scripture and the ability to laugh at our own faults as we seek to live more holy and more full of grace. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We trust in God, spirit of life, creator of all that is and all that is to come, who surrounds us and fills us, who speaks the word of life in us. And so we listen. We listen to Jesus, revealer of God, our brother and teacher, who lived in prayer and in love. Listening to God's voice and doing God's will, he gave his life to love, and God raised him to life that is eternal. And so we follow him. We follow in the power of the Holy Spirit, God alive in us, for the sake of the healing of the world. We trust in the power of forgiveness, the gift of resurrection, the gift of the universal church as the body of Christ, and the mystery of eternal life. Amen. So let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Because there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. Let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord. Because there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. Your brother or your sister too. Yes, there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. They may be from near or from lands afar, travel by morning sun or the evening star. Yes, there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. So let your little light shine, shine, shine. Let your little light shine, oh my Lord, cause there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. Let your little light shine, 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 let your little light shine, oh my Lord, cause there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. It may be me or it may be you. It may be your brother or your sister too. Yes, there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. In times of trouble and in times of woe, now don't you ever let your lamp burn low, cause there might be someone down in the valley trying to get home. So let your little light shine. And now, friends, as you go throughout your week, may you be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And when those times come, 
that you aren't able to do that, because inevitably they will, may you be able to laugh at yourself and to have the objectivity to be aware that we all make mistakes and we all are gifted with the opportunity to begin again. In the name of our Creator, our Savior, and Sustainer, Alleluia. Amen.